The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. I think we're going to do a part two to last week. Last week we talked about experiencing personal awakening. And we talked about some of the, the personal awakenings and, and using the book of Haggai. But what I'm concerned with is being coming fully alive and fully active. Uh, an uninterrupted dialogue with God is not talking constantly. An uninterrupted dialogue with God is spirit to spirit. It's his spirit and my spirit in a divine romance, a romance of wills. And when, when the Lord was teaching me this one time, I said, you know, God, when I, when I take control, it's like I grab a handlebar on the inside when I'm in control. And God said, you know what, Dennis, if you would release that handlebar, that will, to my will, I would wrap my will around it and make it a scepter of authority. How many know what a scepter of a king does? It decrees and declares, so be it. And he says, if your will and my will were intertwined properly, I would cause it to become a scepter of authority that the, the words from your mouth will not fall to the ground. It will basically be my extension of my authority. But my will and your will, it must and it absolutely requires the Lordship of Jesus. Not just being saved, not being spirit-filled, but the Lordship of Jesus for that to work and function properly. So I just said, God, I want that inner, uninterrupted dialogue. You can't talk constantly, you can't get words of knowledge constantly, but you can touch His presence constantly. That awareness is an absolute necessity for the days ahead because you, most of you have more Bible understanding than you have the richness of experiencing spirit to spirit, moment by moment. What we, I believe, uh, this is Jennifer's words, after being married to me for 20 years and saying the truths that we're basically emphasizing in the body of Christ, if you were to put them all together in one package, we are re-educating the body in the process of abiding. How many know that that's in the Bible, John 15? And what's it say? Except you abide in me and my word abides in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Connected to me, you bear fruit. And really, it's basically spiritual relationship, all fruitfulness, all fruit. Matter of fact, you need to say that back because some people think they can get fruit other ways. All fruitfulness comes from relationship. It comes from abiding relationship. Apart from relationship, you are not fruitful. Now, this communion is basically when it's functioning properly. If you're experiencing a real personal awakening, then this mind up here is wide open to creativity that comes from the Spirit. Revelation, you're open to revelation. Many of you have been prophetically trained, you're open to revelation. But we've got to be developed in all three areas because without the communion, without that awareness, you can get stuck up here in your visuals. Huh? Prophetic people? You can get stuck in your visuals and get detached from what's going on in here. So you've got, to be, you've got to be spirit, soul, and body. You've got to be aware of what's going on in your spirit moment by moment because revelations are flashes of insight. Revelations, you see or you hear a word. Those are flashes of insight. They're not continuous. The continuous thing that's necessary for all of that is to remain connected to Him. It's a divine romance of wills. And when that will is yielded, how do you know if that will is yielded in Jesus is Lord? Anybody know? Peace. You should be shouting that. You know, I mean, let the peace of God rule. There's your internal way to experience whether Jesus is Lord at any given moment in your life. Any given moment. No peace. He's not ruling. You might be saved, but he's not ruling. This awakening, this active awareness is 
not only a romance of wills, but it's, it's a life that is aware that there's been a death to your exterior life. You know what I mean by exterior life? Mind, will, and emotions, your soulish nature. It's subordinate now. It's where it belongs. Spirit on top, soul, body, in that order. It, that's lordship. It's, it's the cross, this, this communion. You start, when you're practicing the presence of God and you're feeling his peace, you're basically uh, engaged in the higher life. And that should be our prayer. Deliver me from the lower life. Give me the higher life. And how does that happen? Except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die. So that flesh has to be dealt a death blow. And the way you deal a death blow to the flesh is you submit it in your Bible heart. You submit it to the Lordship of Jesus. And how many people when you're praying, you sit still in your private time, you get a little antsy. You ever do that? I was hyperactive, so I know what this is all about. I'd, I'd sit down, I'm going to pray, I have my Bible, I have my pen, I have my journal, and then I'm going to, maybe I ought to go in the garage and see if there's enough oil for an oil change. Well, maybe, maybe I ought to go, maybe I ought to go, maybe I ought to just check up, maybe I ought to pace a little bit. That helps God. <laughs> if I'm walking, I mean, he knows I'm serious. Okay? All of that stuff God kept taking me to one, taking this hyperactive child to the one scripture where it says, David said, I have quieted my soul within me like a weaned child with its mother. I have to wean myself from all that mental, emotional, and impulsive activity and subject it to the Lordship of Jesus if I was going to really get in his presence and commune. And then after he taught me how to commune spirit to spirit and touch that beautiful presence, he also basically told me that any ugly feeling that popped up was coming between me and him and that that needed to be released through repentance or simply if it was temptation, let it go. It's not that important. Let it go. But when you let it go, you let it go from your spirit, from the door of the heart. Uh, this being fully active and fully awake, this is what I believe God is going to bring the body of Christ to. And actually, we've said this before. Um, people have basically saw that for us, emotional healing is as easy as breathing, and we teach that. But they label us emotional healers. All right. When in reality, that is a tiny part of the picture. That is such a tiny part of the picture. But it's a big deal because there's a lot of people that are walking around emotional basket cases. And you cannot be any more spiritual than your emotions allow. All right. What we want you to enter into is the God emotions. Why did God even give you emotions? For the God emotions of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And God's basically saying that this communion and identifying with the higher life is you're, you're going to be set free from the routine, which is your prisoner. The routine of the flesh. You know the flesh has a routine? It wants to do what it wants to do, and it wants to do it when it wants to do it. I want it now. But you can be liberated. The higher life liberates you from that routine control of mind, will, and emotions telling you what to do. Or worse, even your body telling you what to do. This communion has to learn to leave self in order to find myself, the real me, the new creation me, and yield to the love of God within me. The mind, the will, and the emotions. You've all been taught this over and over again. But picture it like this. Why did God give you a mind and a will and emotions? He wanted them to be sails to so that a wind would blow through that mind, will, and emotions and direct your life. So the mind, will, and the emotions are not something you totally ignore. It's something you submit and surrender. And when they're properly sur surrendered to the Holy Spirit, the wind that is blowing through those sails is Holy Spirit wind. The problem with sails is you can have a bad wind blowing through those sails as well. Huh? Have you ever been around someone that really had a bad wind? You can feel it. You go, whoa, they need ministry, right? Isn't that what you do? Yeah, there's a bad wind blowing there. Have you ever had, have you ever had somebody 
uh, talking to you and you felt like doing this while they were talking because it was like a little overpowering and it wasn't the Holy Spirit? Huh? It's kind of a control spirit. But the beautiful thing, I had one of the best experiences next to the Lord telling me that my will and His will would be in a divine romance and He would make it a scepter of righteousness. That He would give me the go-ahead out of my belly. I would know that it was His will and my delight would be to do His will because it is God who is, do, who is willing and working according to His good pleasure. His will is His pleasure. I want to break a spirit right off, the, a religious spirit right off, the, anybody in this congregation watching by Ustream right now. You've got this, this religious religious spirit that has harassed you that basically is, is telling you that the will of God is the unpleasant thing that you don't want to do. Some were even taught that. You know, if it's the will of God, it's going to be something I don't want to do. That's the cross. That's nonsense. The will of God is His pleasure. And you cannot detract pleasure from the will of God. It is not punishment. If there's punishment, it's your flesh getting in the way. You're beating yourself up with your own carnality and in some cases calling it spiritual warfare. That's not spiritual warfare. That's your flesh. It's slapping you around. The devil can just sit back and look at it. The devil laughed at me one time when, when I was feeling bad about whatever. God called me to ministry and it wasn't going exactly the way I wanted it to go. And so I was going to, and I'm, I'm having a temper tantrum, which tells God, I don't know if you do this, but I was telling God that I was really serious about this problem. So I had a temper tantrum, a little anger, a little anger. And the Lord showed me like in a, in a vision, it was a cartoon even, a cartoon of the devil, pitchfork and everything, you know, the little red horns. I don't know. I was a baby Christian. He had to speak to me in a language I understood, cartoons, all right? And the devil took a gold-plated shovel and handed it to me. And the nameplate on the shovel was self-pity. And I was digging a depression that God said keep it up and it'll be a tomb that you bury yourself the devil was mocking me and laughing at me so in reality he didn't have much to do with it well he handed me the shovel as a go for it but I did it myself we have discovered the enemy it's you <laughs> you can do this and sure, the devil can contribute, but you opened the door. You gave permission. You gave ground and legal ground to the enemy's access. Then he laughed and watched me. And the only thing that saved me, that broke me out of those temper tantrums once and for all, was the fact that I used to like to watch old cowboy movies. And the thing that irritated me more than anything was when the good guy, the bad guy would have the gun on the good guy and tell the good guy to dig your own grave. And I'm going, oh. Man, if this story's going to end, then they're going to shoot the good guy. And worse, he's got to dig his own grave. And the Lord says, just like you. I went, oh. But guess what happened? I stopped doing that. I saw that the temper tantrums were dangerous. Getting mad at God, that kind of stuff, at some point in your life, that's got to go. That's got to go. That's the most ridiculous tool and yet the enemy uses it regularly on believers, even seasoned believers. So God's basically saying, I want you to do this from now on. And this is the challenge, to become fully active in the spirit, to be fully awake for an awakening. I would say start now with slumbering areas in your life and start allowing God's spirit to hover over them and incite them to action. Just like a mother eagle would hover over its nest. And it was like saying to those little baby chicks, I know you don't even have any feathers yet, but guess what? Eventually I'm going to kick you out of this nest and see what I'm doing up here? I'm instilling destiny into you. I'm radiating and incubating and trying to reach your potential. In reality, a lot of times prophetic word is supposed to do that. It's supposed to be igniting your destiny. Doesn't mean that you have it. Doesn't mean you don't have to go to school. Doesn't mean that you don't prepare for it because the person that receives that prophetic word should have been not the same person that received the prophetic word. There should have been a journey of learning and, and anticipation and change, transformation in your life. God basically is expecting you to do what's necessary on that journey. 
But God's basically saying if we, if, if we would see this, here's the way he did it with me, with the moment by moment. Because you see, I'm, I'm getting way ahead of myself here. But the day came and it was the most glorious day of my Christian life where I could commune with God. I could discern his spirit. But I was up and down a lot like a yo-yo, uh, dealing a lot with rejection issues and all kinds of other stuff. But the day came when he showed me how important that was to hold him as precious cargo, right? Just like pregnant ladies. That's precious cargo. And you can still function with this, with an awareness of precious cargo. Awareness, awareness. Say that word back to me. Awareness. Because without that, you're not going to understand anything spiritual. You cannot understand spiritual if you're not aware that that realm even exists. And God's saying, I gave you all an anointing. And it abides within. I would love to teach you. Can we get your flesh out of the way so I can teach you? Are you willing to learn? If you're willing to learn, here's the way the Lord did it to me. Because sometimes even school sounds like discipline. And there is a discipline in it. But here's the way he did it with me and it never left. He basically said, I want you to see every moment. Don't we want to live a moment by moment relationship with you? See every moment as a seed of opportunity. So in other words, I want you to be aware of my spirit because then you can discern. And from that place of discern, you can understand. The soulish man doesn't understand the things of the spirit, but the spiritual man discerns all things. God wants to get all of us to the place where you discern all things, not judge, discern all things. And to do that, he's basically saying every moment in your life, that means every crazy, bad, chaotic, catastrophe that's happened in your life, that moment is a seed. And instead of saying, why is this happening to me? Or I rebuke that, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. All right. I know everybody was taught that. You know what I was taught? In that moment of chaos, destruction, catastrophe, say, God, how do you want me to respond? Far superior to rebuking it. And besides, most people, when they rebuke, if I went by discernment, while they're rebuking, I can feel fear in their spirit. So you have no power. You don't have enough anointing to blow fuzz off a peanut. You know? If you can't do like Jesus and sleep in the boat, you don't have the authority to stand up in the boat and say, peace, be still to the storms around you. Until you can sleep in the boat. Those frightened, those frightened disciples would have had no authority to say anything to that storm, would they? nor you in your own storms of life. God's basically saying if you would treat every minute like a seed sent to us by God, this beautiful life here is a rehearsal for heaven. It's for ruling and reigning for all eternity, but this is the rehearsal. This is where you get it right. And you can go around some mountains a hundred times before you get it right, and then again God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. Now that clicked with me. I, I think I'd rather go the easy way. There's some lessons I learned by doing it wrong 30 times. But there's some things I went, I don't want to do that anymore. All right? So if we're going to get fully awake in our spirit, we need to see every moment, every moment, this moment, right now while you're here, is a seed of opportunity for you to respond. And basically to respond, you can accept or you can reject. But you can't even accept or reject until you understand. And you can't understand until you're aware there's a spiritual realm. Holy, evil, and human spirits are interacting in this room, whether you're aware of it or not. But you can train your spirit to become aware. And once I learned that every moment, I wanted that moment-by-moment -moment relationship, and every moment was precious. I don't remember exactly when it happened, but it was like I used to be up and down like a yo-yo, like, a like we teach the kids, bucket man. You know, sometimes my bucket was down here enjoying God, and other time my bucket was up here going, oh my God, what are we going to do now? You know, <laughs> all right? The day came when it was like that cord was cut and the bucket remains here and it enjoys an uninterrupted communion with God and if it gets interrupted you can promptly get back there, promptly. That should be the goal for a Christian. That should be the goal of a spirit-filled Christian for a moment by moment. Because what God is going to do, and you're going to see this happening. Jennifer's got all her degrees in counseling and psychology. And basically when she saw how quick this was, she said, counseling and some, some Christian counseling 
as we know it, is going to fade away, that it was a, what do you call it, a stopgap? Temporary. Temporary plan to help people. But the day is going to come when the, when the body learns to abide in a moment by moment. We are not inner healers, by the way. I hate that. Because they, you, you're seeing a tiny little part of the picture. Emotional healing is as easy as breathing for us, and we're teaching that to the body of Christ. But most counseling is going to fade away because people are going to learn to abide. When you abide in the vine, you deal with 99% of the stuff that's in your life that you would go to counseling for. It's fading away. It's old school. It's old fashioned. And in many cases, it takes longer to get a result than if the person just went to Jesus themselves, if they knew how. If they knew how to abide. Not if they're up here trying to figure life out. But when they're down comfortably, where the mind, will, and the emotions are comfortably subordinate to the Spirit, He will teach you and guide you into all truth. Now, we'll always need experts. I'm not saying we'll never need experts. I'm saying most of it could be eliminated if we really, really learn to abide. And that's really what we're trying to restore to the church. So they can call us whatever they want because people put names on based on whatever they think uh, their, their own paradigm dictates. But I'll tell you what, it's practicing the presence of God 24-7 is the goal. That's really what it should be for all believers, learning how to carry that precious cargo in a moment-by-moment -moment relationship. That word, uh, properly accepted as a love gift from God. See, here's the, the one I believe. I believe that if you tap into the will of God and you abandon yourself to the will of God, you find His pleasure, not His drudgery. That's religion, and that needs broken. I command a spirit of religion off of me or anyone else that would make the will of God drudgery. That is pure and simple and contrary to the nature of Jesus, God's nature, His will is His pleasure. I delight to do Thy will, is what He said to the Father. That's what Jesus said. I delight to do Thy will. I have my own idea, but nevertheless, not my will, but Thy will be done. And I will face the opposition to my flesh. Because I'm going to lay hold of that divine romance of my will, and I'm going to stay there till your will wraps around my will, till I have the scepter of authority to accomplish the purposes that God has given me. And it'll be a delight. It'll be a pleasure. Pleasure, His will and His pleasure are inseparable. That's healthy spirit-to-spirit -spirit communion. Revelation will rule your mind. Your conscience starts to rule over your, over your, uh, your will. You don't, you don't violate your conscience. You get a sensitive conscience and basically live in, uh, to where the love of God or the Spirit is communing over your emotions at all times. You cannot have a good or a bad relationship without emotions. That has to be restored to the church. That was my other sermon four things that have to be restored, but I ain't going to go there, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, you better start paying attention to emotions because it's been neglected in the church and it's going to be necessary for a good or an evil relationship. You need the emotions. So don't you think you ought to understand how they operate? Don't you think they ought to be, you were bought with the price, you're not your own. You have no right to play church and say, uh, I, I just speak the word. I just speak the word. Mind, will, mind, will. Guess what? There's no relationship in mind, will. It's whatever's ruling the emotions at that time. And if you have them suppressed, like I don't need to feel, I don't want to feel, if you have them suppressed that you're in control. Jesus is not Lord of them, and you're, you're basically a loose cannon. You're just an accident going somewhere to happen. Because that emotion that you hold down, you're not that tough. It's like holding a rubber ball underwater. Eventually, at all the wrong times and all the wrong places, just when you least expect it, <laughs> out comes a manifestation. <laughs> and then you get embarrassed that you manifest. Where did that come from? Well, that was in there all along. That didn't just fall out of heaven. That was in you. That's what you were suppressed. That's what you were keeping under in your own strength. And what is suppressed will be expressed eventually. I don't want eventually. I want to be prepared. I want it to be so submitted to God that it just draws me in relationship closer to God and man. God is active. He's working in you to will and to do. Do you understand that scepter? Do you understand your will? Do you even know where your will is? 
98% of the church, when we'd say, where's your will? They'd go like this. If you're watching by Ustream, don't do this. this is, your will is here. The door of the heart. How'd the children learn? Close your eyes and drop down and open the door of your heart. We're talking four, five, and six-year-olds. Open the door of your heart. Is there a warning? And the kids went, yeah. No, it's not good to close the door to Jesus. Isn't that good? Guess what? That works for you too. It's not good to close the door to Jesus. Oh, I don't ever close the door to Jesus. You close the door to Jesus. How many are how have been saved more than 20, 30 years? Okay, and now I'm going to tell you what you do wrong, 20 or 30 years. You walk into a grocery store or a Walmart or something and you see somebody that did you wrong and right down here you do this. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, there's someone's. Uh-oh. You know what you just did? You closed the door to Jesus. You went into self-protection. You closed the door of your heart. You said, uh-oh, there's so-and-so. So, how mature do you feel now? Huh? Uh-oh. You're on your own when you do uh-oh. You put that wall up, you close the door to Jesus. Jesus goes, all right, have it your way. You're going to handle that person coming down the aisle yourself. You decided to take matters into your own hands. Okay. Deal with it. That person comes down the aisle and they lay into you and say something horrible, demonic. That little, little door that you closed goes right through that and you get slimed. Self-preservation does not stop spiritual activity. So then you get bummed out. It says the words of a gossip are like tasty morsels. You hear them with your ears, right? But it says it goes down into the innermost parts of the belly. This is where you get slimed. You heard the words of gossip with your ears. And it was like, hmm, tell me more, tell me more. But the poison goes down into the innermost parts of the belly. Guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. But guard your heart is peace guards my heart and my mind. Peace means what? Who's Lord? Jesus. Let the peace of God rule. You feel like you're in kindergarten today. I feel like I'm talking to kindergarten. When it comes to the spirit sometimes, the children's language works better. We have a tendency to want to guard our thoughts and guard this and guard that, when in reality, if you don't guard your heart, it's not going to work. Now, I want to get to the good part. <laughs> when you abide and you become an instrument of his activity, it's like uh, there's scriptures that talk about awakening the harp and the, the lyre. Awaken those instruments. When you awaken an instrument, what do, you, what do you want it to do? You want it to perform at its optimum. You want to awaken and pull the gold out of it. God says, I want to incite you to action. I want to awaken you out of a slumber. There's gifts in this room that need to be awakened, that they're in there, but it's almost like they're sleepy. And God's saying, you need a rude awakening. <laughs> you need an alarm clock. You need to come out of that sleep. And a lot of your Christianity, you're walking in like a sleepwalk. Hmm? Isn't that scary? You're walking asleep. And you do things in a dream. We shared this last week. You'll do things in a dream that you wouldn't dare do in real life, right? Have you ever done anything in your dreams that you wouldn't do in real life? Uh-huh. Or at least not if you couldn't get caught. All right? But nevertheless... God would have us in an awakened state to where our spirit was fully alive and fully active and fully aware that we would basically be doing things differently. Do you believe that? There'd be some things in our routine, our routine self, that would be brought under and we would find a higher life, higher activity, higher awareness, higher performance in the things that God's calling it, and a delight in the journey, not drudgery. When you become his instrument, that frantic, anxious work. And I, I'm, I'm interceding for a, a number of people that I know both uh, in the local church and outside the local church. That quite frankly, they're highly gifted, but I can, they're, they're living in too much frantic anxiety. That is not God. That is not hard work for Jesus. That's frantic anxiety. That is not scriptural. Be anxious for nothing but by prayer. 
Frantic anxiety does not glorify God. If anything, it glorifies you. Frantic, anxious work done under pressure cannot be dedicated to God because God never wills that kind of work. Does that make sense? If He doesn't will that kind of work, who are you pleasing then? With frantic, anxious work that is done under pressure cannot be dedicated to God because He never wills such activity. I believe that what God's going to do is He's going to get us to the place where He's going to train us. I, I want to train you a little bit this morning the way He trained me. Now, I didn't do this in one day. I did this in a period of years. But He always took me back to Isaiah 50. So if you want to wake up, there's some keys here that would apply to everybody. Isaiah 50, God told me, to Dennis, I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple that you would know how to speak a word in season to him who's weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear, but it's not this ear. And what he's awakening is not me out of bed. That's hard enough. That's my flesh. And like I said, there was times that God would brush like a feather across my spirit, and I knew he wanted to commune. And I would put a leg out of the bed so that gravity would slide me down to the side that I could pray. And I can remember, uh, and I've shared this before, I can remember the time that I felt that little brush of the Spirit and I was just too tired and I didn't want to. And it was a long time before I felt that presence again. So you know, you can grieve, quench, and resist a person. You can treat the Holy Spirit as an it rather than as a person. And, but when you treat him as a person, you realize you can offend, grieve, and quench him. And that was healthy for me because then God basically said, I'm going to awaken you from a slumbering, inactive spirit to fellowship, to friendship, to commune. Awake, awake you who sleep and arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. That's basically what he was doing with me. He was awakening me not just out of bed, but he was awakening my ear to hear as the Spirit says in Isaiah 50. When does He do this? Lamentations 3, 22. Though the Lord's mercies are not consumed because His compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. When are they? New every morning. Every morning, morning by morning, I awaken your ear to hear what the Spirit says. And basically... It says, when you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am He and that I do nothing of myself. But as the Father has taught me, I speak. One of the first things He taught me with giving me the ear of a disciple was my nonstop talking did not produce anything. My confession, proclamation, da, 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 that was a lot of out of the hyperactive me. Did you know you can do hyperactive Christianity? You know what He told me? And this was for a talker, and I'm a talker, and I wanted to tell God everything. He told me, shut up and listen. You haven't got anything to say until you heard something. I went, whoa, that was a rebuke. You don't have nothing to say until you've heard something. I thought I had plenty to say. I even found out later as he was fine-tuning me, I would go like he would say, the Lord would take a scripture and it would talk about, uh, you know, there was a, a well of wisdom. And I'd go, there's a well, there's a river, there's a river that makes glad the city of God. And I would feel the anointing decrease while I was preaching to Jesus. And I didn't get that. Like, he gave me a, a word, it was alive, and I got excited, and then I preached back to him everything I knew about that word. But the anointing was going away, and I'm going, what is going on? I feel like he's departing. <laughs> and, oh, he wasn't done talking. Oh, I get it. And as soon as I went back to listening state, the anointing increased. Quick to hear. <laughs> I didn't know that part. I only knew quick to speak. Quick to hear. Oh, no. Slow to speak. But he basically said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And for an active person like myself, he says, sacrifice and offerings I do not desire. 
nor do you have any delight in them. You have given me a capacity to hear and obey. And that fortified the concept of ask me how to respond when stuff's going wrong. Don't say, why is this happening? That usually doesn't go anywhere anyway. How do you want me to respond? Everything's falling apart, God. And then shut up long enough to get some kind of an answer instead of filling it in with what you think it might be. Because every time I did that, I had an A, B, C, D, and then eventually God would say none of the above. So, I mean, we can, we can waste a lot of time where if we exalted and honored the relationship, we'd hear a lot more. So God basically said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I don't want your sacrifice and your offerings. I don't care about all your activity and what you've done for me. Because you know what? Some of that I didn't even tell you to do. I said, what? He said, some of that I didn't tell you, what to, I didn't tell you to do that. You did it because it was a good thing. A good thing is not necessarily a God thing. Do you think we need to be in better communion? Yes. Real communication, by the way, the highest form of communication is expressing Jesus through us. It's not in words. It's in your relationship. The highest form, Jesus said, he said that to Philip. Peter, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the highest form of communication. The words that he spoke, the death that he died, the miracles that he did, all of that was an expression. But basically, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The highest form. Now, God's basically saying, I'm going to open your ear. Isaiah 50, he showed me I needed to be fully dedicated. There was a co-knowing with God, an intertwined heart or a, a, a romance of wills, fused as a scepter, and agreeing with God about me. Now, we're on the verge of an awakening, and I want to do altar ministry today, and I want to pray for every single person for whosoever, so i got to cut this a little short. Um, but in this, this awakening, we need to be awakened to the fact that God is inside. Isn't that part of our message, Jennifer? A full stature of messages. We've got to get the church back to closing the gap between that implied distance. We would say in churches of a thousand people even, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Real quick, point to Jesus. 98% did that. There's some implied distance that's got to be changed. We've got to become more God inside, minded as a lifestyle. Not, yes, he's in heaven, but the real relationship is Christ in you. That's one of the great mysteries. Oh, that's the other sermon. Anyway. Secondly, we need to be awakened to the needs and attitudes. This is where people labeled us counselors. Awaken to the needs and attitudes that needs to be dealt with. If you don't deal with that, all your good intentions are just a waste of time. You've got to be so aware of what's going on in you that, that attitudes need to come to your attention by the power of the Holy Spirit. He will show you an attitude. I remember uh, I had a a young man in my church that basically used to get beatings from his father all the time. And he said, my father would say the same thing. And I'm going, he's probably right. He would say, he would say it, son, it's not what you did, it's your attitude. And that just didn't register in the kid's head. Well, I didn't do nothing wrong. It's your attitude. I'd be in trouble if I told Jennifer. Jennifer says, oh, I made you fried chicken for dinner. Chicken, fried chicken. <laughs> now, what I said was just fried chicken. But I think that attitude could get me in trouble. Do you think? Uh huh. The men in this church, if you're watching by Ustream, every morning they ask their wife, What may I do to please you today? The will of God is pleasure. What must I do to please you today? Are you saying that to your wives? Don't answer. <laughs> but God wants to awaken the capacity to deal effectively with those attitudes. He wants to bring instruction to you. He wants to heal those negative emotions. And emotional healing should be as easy as breathing for anyone that's been trained, even marginally, in the full stature uh, lifestyle. 
which is basically learning the way I learned it. I'd close my eyes and I'd be communing with God and I'd feel that spirit to spirit home. You, know, you like what I'm saying right now? You feel that? And just me and Jesus. And then I would see my foreman's face in my mind. And down here, I went, Ugh. And I received from Jesus in me the forgiver. I would receive forgiveness and I would release forgiveness. I would receive forgiveness for letting it interfere with me and my Jesus. And that's really the way he taught me. He just basically said, Dennis, don't let anything come between what you and I have together. And so whatever that foreman, whatever, it's not worth it, is it really? I released forgiveness and the peace came back and I was in communion with Jesus. I won't let anything come between what you and I have together because it's a relationship, it's not religion. And it's as easy as breathing and anyone can do it. God basically says that I want to awaken your eyes and ears to follow the flow of the Holy Spirit, to actually follow flow. If you are judging and you're in a judgmental mode, you cannot follow flow. It's impossible because you're left to your own devices. If you are following flow, you are tracking with what the Holy Spirit's doing. And that was meant to be a lifestyle. Actually, you know what? You know the easy way to teach this? Is practice this for a whole day. Red light, green light, yellow light. You know what to do in the traffic with that. Well, as long as you got a green light, enjoy. Yellow light might mean, uh, like when, when Jennifer tells me no, I get a yellow light. It makes me rethink. Can I go? And she'll go, ah, that's a no. But I learned that by the yellow light first. Like, her head went up and down, but it doesn't feel quite right here. I don't feel like I got a, something tells me in my gut I don't have a green light yet. She went, ah. It's like, men, can I go play basketball with the guys? Go. Don't go. Right? <laughs> Didn't you learn that by now? Red light, green light, yellow light. If you went with your gut, you'd know the answer. If you're a concrete thinker, you just go, they said go, right? How many know that life is more than just what people say? You can fool people with your words, you can fool them with your gestures, but you can't hide what emanates. And if their head's going yes, and their spirit's saying no, obey the spirit, right? No. I want to kind of cut to awakening the slumbering spirit. I want to get to the, the problem and some ministry to resolve it. There's two primary causes for your spirit to get deadened, asleep. And sometimes it's only asleep in certain areas and it's awake in others. The first one is it was never really ever awakened. You can be saved, filled with the Spirit, and still basically slumbering. You live out of the soul. You live out of the reasoning mind. And the reason for it, I believe, is an inadequate love, nurture, and even physical touch. Did you know that a baby, if it's born, if it's never held, what's that called, Jennifer? A failure to failure to thrive, it would die without human touch. We need touch. We need touch by the Spirit and we need practical touch. We need to be able to be aware relationally. If that awakening is necessary, then that just precludes that what we've been preaching is necessary. We need to reparent the church. There are children that were raised where the mother never hugged, ever. Or the father didn't know how to show that because what? He didn't have it happen. And then they replicate. So it's not like they don't want to love. They don't know 
How? Their spirit has literally never been called to life. And that's why we're a firm believer that reparenting the church, Jesus can do it. He can take your worst case scenario and put the life back into your spirit. And he'll start by mothering before fathering. Remember we talked about that? What's mothering? First, you've got to feel safe and secure. What I'm doing even this morning is not mothering, I'm fathering. I am basically want to unpack your potential. But you can't unpack the potential of somebody who doesn't feel safe and secure. I'm like, well, I don't know if I trust you. So you can't unpack that person. And I say, best thing for you is join the army. They'll unpack you. They'll be your mother, your father, <laughs> your entire family. And they will unpack you whether you are ready or not, whether you feel safe or secure or not. That's kind of the force program. But I'll tell you what, it was the best thing that ever happened. I hated every minute I was in boot camp, but I felt gloriously vindicated when I got out. I did it. Especially when you saw guys committing suicide. That was a real, very real thing, unfortunately. But they would have probably have done it sometime in their life anyway. They just pulled, it pulled out some of those weaknesses and insecurities. But if you're going to go into a combat zone, I'd rather go in a combat zone with someone that didn't break, wouldn't you? If they're to my left or to my right, I'd want someone that have had the sufficient training. And now I believe even in the church, I believe God's given us tools for PDSI, PDSD, uh, is what it used to be called, because uh, those traumas can be healed. Church is the answer. The world is in perplexity. That means they ran out of answers. And the day is going to come when the, when the eyes of the world are going to turn to the church for solutions. And you're going to be a solution-oriented people. And you're going to, they're going to come to you. Right now, right now there's, there's still too much carnality. But in the reality, God's going to make you spiritual beings that can discern. And you're going to have answers. You're going to, have, you're going to be able to troubleshoot situations. So I want to pray this morning for those who have inadequate love and nurture and physical touch. Uh, it occurs in infancy, even early childhood. It can be exaggerated by abuse or neglect. And it might even be generational. Because we talked about that. How many fathers that don't know how to show affection to their kids, but their father didn't show them affection. It can be generational. That can be broken. Your spirit has the capacity to make you brand new. It's just a question. You have an anointing that abides within. It wants to teach you. Will you get out of the way and allow it to teach you? God wants to bring a whole new dimension of awakening, inciting to action like that mother eagle hovering over its nest. Like an instrument, I want to bring, I want to increase your range. I want to bring you to operating at optimum. I want you to really see what's in there operating at its fullest potential, maximum potential. The second area that I want to pray for this morning are those who were highly sensitive when you got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. You were ministering to people left and right, maybe in music, maybe in, in, in uh, prophecy, maybe in whatever. But you were, you were active and you were alive and then somebody nails you real good and you retreated. You got hurt in the church. Oh, like I, no one's ever heard that expression. Hurt in the church. Every battle-scarred person I've seen was hurt in the church. But God's only got one solution. He loves His church. It's plan A. So guess what? You're going to have to find out how do I get healed of my hurt in the church. And for those watching by Ustream, those that have stayed home, that have been spirit-filled, full of gifts and glory, you are not, you, all your excuses are going to fall by the wayside. You're going to stand up before Jesus when you die, and He's going to say, how much did you love with your life? And you say, well, I got hurt in the church, so I quit going. It's not going to hold up. You need to return. It's going to be the wool of sheep that's going to heal even some shepherds. There's shepherds watching right now that have basically dropped out of ministry. And I'm telling you something. God's going to, God's going to say that it's going to be the wool of sheep that's going, to, that's going to soothe you and comfort you and bring you back into an active awareness of your gifts and your callings on the inside. And maybe you don't go back into full-time ministry, but by golly, you begin to enjoy the journey. of, of It's not about a job. It's about your life. It's about being fully awake, fully awake, fully active, and fully alive. Do you have a problem with that? And if you say you're doing that in isolation, you are deceived. Amen. It's unscriptural. You are not doing that 
in isolation. He that isolates himself seeks what he wants, not God. And you're hurt and you're wounded. And I'm telling you, there's some listening right now, and I know it. I can see it just like a beat dog. You beat a dog enough, you can hold out a filet mignon to that dog, and it's going to be very hesitant to take it. Even if it wants it, even if it's on the borderline starving, it's going to be cautious. So I'm telling you, guess what? You can claim you had a dictator pastor. You can claim that you've been hurt by Christians. You can claim all of that stuff. But I'll tell you what, God is smart enough that he's made people in your life as divine appointments for the purpose of divine connection for you to get healed up and on your feet and standing on your own alone. So your excuses are invalid. Sorry. And see, I believe even me saying it that way is a rude awakening because that's what it takes for some. It takes an alarm clock. Beating around the bush, telling them I love them. Of course you love them. But without a warning, without a rude awakening, they will stay in that sleep and in that slumber. So, Father, right now, this is the day of bringing forth a rude awakening. We used to say people needed to bottom out. I think more than bottom out, I think they need to come alive. I think they need to wake up out of that stupor and out of that sleep. That's more important than bottoming out. Some of you are already at the bottom. Time you get up. Some have been down for the count, and God's saying, get up. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. It's only the wicked that are down for the count. Right? When they're down, they're down permanently. But though a righteous man gets knocked down, time after time after time again, he gets back up. Learn from it and then do what's right. That's the way he made me handle my mistakes. Learn from it and then do what's right. When I fall, I will arise. The prophet basically said, <clears throat> Nahum, right? I think it was the nail. When I fall down, I will arise. So here's the two. We're going to pray for this this morning. You were sensitive at one time, but you retreated and fell into slumber. You can go, here's, here's a clue too. You can go through the form of religion, but you lack spiritual relationship. In other words, some of them, you still go to church but you're numb. You just go through the motion so you don't appear backslidden. You might be backslidden, you might be just wounded, but either way, God's got a plan for that, to wake up out of that. So there's two categories I want to pray for this morning. I want to pray for the ones that have, first I want the ones that you feel like maybe I was never awakened to relationship. I've always been able to hide in a crowd, so to speak. I've always been able to just be part of the crowd, and that was kind of like my safety. But I'm going to pray right now. I don't think I can call everybody up for this. I, wanna, I want you to do it right in your seats, just as effective. Laying on of hands, no laying on of hands. But Father, right now, these are my beloved sons in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. I want her to open up right now, right where you're at, Male and female, I want you to open up to new sensitivities to His Spirit. Open up. Receive forgiveness for blocks and walls. That's what it feels like in your spirit when you've shut down from people, when you've shut down areas from God. I won't, uh, I won't I'll never do children's ministry. And God might have called you to do children's ministry. I don't know, if I don't do kids. I don't do singing. I don't do dancing. I don't do talking, I don't do, I don't do. Those are called walls. What are you afraid of? God wouldn't make you do anything that His will wasn't in it and His pleasure wasn't in it. So I say, Father, right now, I release any barriers or any walls. I believe that God is hovering over me like an eagle right now, and He's just allowing His Spirit to fall upon me and incubate on me and call forth my destiny, call forth the goal that's on the inside in the name of Jesus. Rise, arise like a mighty man of war. Rise up with a shout. 
God showed me a long time ago that he was breaking through a net, a net like it looked like only spaghetti to Jesus, but it was like a spaghetti net of, of seducing spirits and soul ties, bad relationships that have kept my people down wrong relationships and God is saying I'm here to purify that today and the son of righteousness is going to rise with healing in his wings and like a mighty warrior Isaiah 43 13 42 13 42 13 <laughs> he's rising up with a shout right now and those those soul ties those emotional spaghetti nets are being broken through and he's rising up through it i want you to release forgiveness to um, to any relationships that are unhealthy right now i release a river of forgiveness out of my belly flows a river and is flowing out right now toward loving forgiveness toward any unhealthy relationships i release forgiveness to them and I drink in and accept like a gift. I receive forgiveness for my participation in unholy alliances. God is breaking unholy alliances. God is says, just as I will set divine appointments in your life to become divine connections, so the enemy has sent divine appointments. And the counterfeit will always precede the legitimate. That's how you'll know. And how will you know if it's a counterfeit or a legitimate relationship? The counterfeit will always cause you to compromise a godly value system. Always. There's always compromise to a godly value system. We're messing with people today. I can feel this. And now God, now that that ungodly net is broken I want them to see the provision that you placed in their life let the scales fall from their eyes and see the provision that is right before them for you have always made a way of escape you have always there's no such thing as a trap if you're listening by Ustream and you think you're trapped and you're not going to church no more, you don't have this no more, you know, all these excuses. There is absolutely no such thing as a trap. That's just a tool of the enemy. That is a demonic tool of choice for the enemy, a trap. There is no temptation such as overtaking you, such as is common to man of which God always is smart enough to give a way of escape. There is always a way of escape and it's always toward him, toward him. He is the way, there's always a way, he is the way. It's a light at the end of your tunnel. And I believe there's people watching by Ustream that right now God is drawing you with cords of love and you feel the tugging on your heart and you go, but I don't even know where to begin. You just began. All you have to do is begin. Begin by looking at the light of the end of the tunnel and holding the heart open and God will deliver you there. He will guide your path. You acknowledge him in all your ways. He'll direct that path. You're acknowledging him from your heart. You're holding it open and you hold it open. Love never fails. Love will come through. You just hold your heart open. It's like the kids say, it's not good to close the door to Jesus. Keep your heart open. Father, reparent in these days ahead. Those that need, that need affection those that need proper touch, those that understand uh, that they need to be, feel safe and secure like a mother is supposed to make a child feel, safe and secure, but like a father that they get their goods unpacked and that they reach their maximum potential, that they're given the opportunity to stand on their own two feet and be all that God created them to be, nothing more, nothing less, maximum potential. We thank you for this. Father, we just pray that there's, a, there's loving discipline that takes place. Thank you for your goodness. The goodness is the fruit of the Spirit that has both loving discipline in it. It's when the parent loves you, but they forbid you to do something you want to do, but it was for your own good. It's time that parents, you quit trying to be your kid's friend and you be the parent. Somebody's got to be the parent. Some insecure parents want to be their child's friend and so they're afraid to parent properly. 
Father, we say that by the power of the Spirit, draw those into the place of relationship to where they're, they're, they begin to blossom in their maturity as mature mothers and fathers. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Okay, I want the second category. And probably the second category can be in this room, I'm sure. But they're more than likely the multitude of those watching by Ustream have experienced this at some level. These are those who were alive, flourishing in the body of Christ, enjoying spirit-to-spirit -spirit communion, moving in the gifts of the Spirit, and then wounded and retreated. Father, there is a solution for them. There is a solution for you. And the blame game is over in Christianity. You are the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You should be the most forgiven people on the face of the earth. You are the most forgiven. You should be the most forgiving. So Father, we release forgiveness to all those perpetrators that wounded us in the body of Christ. Out of my belly flows a loving intercession and releasing a jubilee day. I'm releasing and canceling the debt. They don't owe me anything. I owe them to love and to release that loving intercession. It frees me, it liberates me, it takes me out of the confined, restricted, so-called Christian life. If you're living a confined, restricted life, you're not fully awake, you're not fully alive, you're not fully aware of what's going on around you. I release forgiveness to those that wounded me, and it has nothing to do with whether they ever repent. It's unilateral. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I need to get out of the prison house of resentment and excuses. 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 Right now, we serve notice on excuses are not from God. They're from the devil. Excuses. God can't heal an excuse. He wants you to humble your heart and admit. If you're going to be wrong, try this. Be 100% wrong. Some people don't even know what 100% wrong is. Well, I was wrong, but so-and-so was partly to blame. All right? You're never going to get set free. If you're going to be wrong, be 100% wrong. Face your pain. The whole world runs from pain, and there's Christians watching right now that you've retreated away from the church, God's only plan, and you think you've concocted another plan. And God's basically saying, I'm telling you that today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. It's time for you to decide. It's time for you to decide who you serve. You serve the Lord or you serve yourself in isolation. Father, we pray that those that are backslidden or wounded, guess what? God's got a solution. Emotional healing is as easy as breathing. So Father, we pray for them right now in Jesus' name to go to the Jesus within and let him take your pain and your sorrow. He takes it every time, providing you give it to him, providing you're not afraid of the word repentance or forgiveness. And there's never been a historical awakening without repentance. Historically, there's never been an awakening without repentance. So why not start now and just simply say, God, I want to be fully awake, fully alive, and fully active for the days ahead. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Next week, you get the other two messages. Seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bless them. Cause it to reside within them. And we just release and activate all of the good that is in them to rise up and overflow. We want a manifestation. I mean, a good manifestation. We want a manifestation of the love of God to love one another. And before we close, can you put that, uh, is Cliff there? Can you put that chart up? I've got two minutes to show you where I believe the church is going. This is something I jotted down. You did, you put it on a slide. This is something that I did in my prayer time. And that if anybody studied our material about abiding, you would, <laughs> you, 
you will see a process that is actually logical, a logical process to a spiritual function. There we go. All right. Everything, everything that is taught in all of our modules and all of our books is to reorient. You'll hear a lot of repetition, and I do that on purpose. I'm not senile. Everything is to get you to that first column on the left. God focused, meaning Christ within. God searched instead of counseling or somebody else telling you what's wrong with you. God protected, teaching that the peace of God will guard your heart, that if you're walking in that Walmart and you drop down to Jesus, I don't care what that person says, it cannot penetrate peace. Jesus really does guard your heart and your mind, but few Christians try it. Almost everybody puts up the wall, closes the door to Jesus to try to protect themselves. God ruled. Let the peace of God rule. The peace challenge. You should walk moment by moment in peace. You shouldn't make any decisions that are not in peace. You shouldn't, right? You make a decision when you're angry or fearful, and I'll tell you what, it's bad. That second column is just what it says. That's a person that's self-focused. What's wrong with me? I'm a failure. I'm no good. God's not in that. That's all you doing that. I'm no good. I'm a failure. I should be better. Self-search. I'm going to stay up tonight and figure out what's wrong with me. That doesn't have God in it. Self-protected. Okay, before you laugh now, self-protected is when you see a, 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 an individual that could be hostile and you go, you shut the door of your heart. That's still self-protected. It doesn't work. You're not trusting Jesus. You're not going, Jesus, here comes that demonic person. That's what I do. Ah, there's a demonic person over there and they're manifesting. I dropped down to Jesus. I could even be part of the solution. <laughs> Instead of worrying about me catching something. Self-ruled. Codependent. These are the people that they need everybody in the body to do it to them. Pray for me. Hardly ever in victory. You know what codependent means. Others searched. What's wrong with me? Counsel me. Let me tell you my whole life story for nine hours. <laughs> Others protected. Pray for me. Pray for me. No authority to deal with the enemy in their, whole, in their own life. It's always everybody else got to do it. And lastly, others ruled. Basically, tell me what to do and I will do it. Didn't the children of Israel do that? Moses, you go up and talk to God and then tell us what he says and then we'll do whatever he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you won't. You're just avoiding a relationship. The last one, Jennifer's going to teach on it, but I think it's pretty advanced. I believe there's, a, there's a, a dimension that God wants us to enter into that is so, you've already done the first one spiritually. You are the patient. The first one, the first column, you learn to live that way. After you learn to live that way, it's basically others orientation. But it's coming out of an others orientation that is totally God-centered others orientation. It would be like Stephen was so others that while he's being stoned, he didn't say, oh, I'm just going to, I'm going to pray that those stones stop or I'm going to pray that that doesn't hurt. He basically said, Father, do not hold that sin against them. Or Paul saying, I would go to hell for my brethren, the Jews. That kind of a mindset does not come up here. That mindset comes out of a, an abandonment and a surrender that is at a level that the church doesn't even understand. But there are many greats throughout history who found that place of abandonment to God. And I'm believing that in a time of awakening, we're going to get all of that good stuff's going to come back in. And I'll tell you what, I want to plan for it now. I'm praying for that last level myself right now. I'm not satisfied with my own Christian life. I'm not satisfied with what it is, where I'm at. Are you satisfied with where you're at? No. That last column is going to be something else. That last column is going to be, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's going to be, but in reality. 
It's going to be considered pure joy when you fall into various trials, that the testing of your faith produces patience. Just think, when Stephen got stoned and gave up his life, there was no self-protection. He basically said, do not hold that sin against them. And the Apostle Paul was standing there holding the garments of the people that stoned him. Don't tell me that did, that's not power. That's the power to change a life. And don't tell me, Paul, that wasn't the seed that he could never shake. Tell me that wasn't the first thing he thought of. I know when my little cross on my neck hung out of my shirt when I was unsaved working on my machine and a guy walked by and said, does that cross mean anything to you or is it a mere decoration? I didn't get saved for many years later, but I never forgot that statement. It sticks like a claw. Is that a decoration or does it mean something to you? Does the name of Jesus a decoration or does it mean something to you? So, does that make sense? Yep, yep. I thought that was an easy way to explain. Every th book we have, everything we teach, is to get the person to the first column, but ultimately the last column. But you've got to be the patient before you're the doctor. A good doctor knows what a patient was like. In other words, let the Word discern you before you discern other people. <laughs> let the Word discern you, let Him do His work in you, and then release that Spirit to be a blessing to other people. That's what we live for. And I just thought, for the first time, I said, that's the easiest way I know how to explain it. So you pick up any of our books, The Supernatural Power of Peace, any of them, and it's, you're going to see that first column in everything that's taught. Everything I said this morning is in that first column. It's fathering in the truest sense because it's getting you to stand on your own two feet rather than looking for someone to do it to you. Is it wrong to have somebody minister to you? Absolutely not. But what are you going to do when you're alone? It's going to be your relationship that you're going to, that you're going to stand or fall. So Father, seal this work right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Cause that, that, even that chart to be written on the tablet of the heart. Cause them to recognize the difference in the body of Christ. When they compare us, they have a tendency to compare us with the, the carnal nature. They compare us sometimes to counselors. That is such a, a disservice because so much of that is, is done without the Holy Spirit. So much of it is done by analysis. I want awareness of the presence of God and the will of God. So, Father, we thank you. Seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. 
you will never be the same.